An early description of Runcorn poetically described the area as a lovely, cheerful, prosperous village where smiling orchards bordered down to the river, with wild boar and stag in the thick forests, and a river rich and teeming with salmon. Runcorn developed rapidly during the 19th century as a result of inland waterway undertakings and so became an important canal port. Apart from chemicals, there was a major trade in clay destined for the Stoke potteries. Census records, which first began in March 1801, show that between 1801 and 1901, the town endured the fastest rate of growth in the country, its population rising from a few hundred to 20,000 in a boom created by the advent of the Manchester Ship Canal. River and canal crossings have presented their problems throughout the town's history. The old transporter, too slow, gave way to a solution that would solve Runcorn's traffic problems, a road bridge. A new boom came about in the 1970s that brought an end to the tranquility, greenery and open spaces of tiny Aspmore as new town developments got underway. Today, a second crossing of the town's waterways is being sought, perhaps opening a new phase in Runcorn's history. There are two main theories as to how Runcorn got its name. One is that the Romans gave the name Runcora, which means a place overrun with brambles and briars. The other, which is believed to be the correct one, as there's no real evidence of the Romans having settled in the district, is of Saxon origin, Rum Kofan. Rum meaning broad and spacious, and Kofa, which means cave or chamber. And so Rum Kofan would have been known as the Large Cave. The name changed to Runcoven, then Ronchestorn, later becoming Runkhorn, and eventually Runcorn. Runcorn first got itself into recorded history when Princess Ethelfrieda, daughter of King Alfred, visited the town in 916 AD to inspect her fortress, which had been built at Runcorn Gap. It was to protect the northern frontier of her kingdom against the Vikings. Where there was a fortification, there would have been a church. It's believed that Princess Ethelfrieda founded Runcorn's first church, probably on the same ground as the parish church of All Saints. Today's church was rebuilt 150 years ago on the site of an earlier square-towered medieval church. The princess's castle was left to fall into decay after her death on June the 12th, 919. Its towers crumbled and, with the passing of time, were swept away. The railway bridge spans part of the area where the fort once stood. Originally, the wide area that Runcorn covered included several manors united to the barony of Halton. In 1115, William Fitz Nigel, the second baron of Halton, achieved one of the highest ambitions of a nobleman by founding at Runcorn a house of canons of the Order of St. Augustine. By 1134, the black hooded canons had moved to Norton, where a priory was to be built which would become their permanent home. The sandstone for Norton Priory was quarried on Windmill Hill, which was within the lands given to the Priory by the Baron of Holton. The stone was roughly squared before it was carried about a mile by horse and cart to the Priory. Here, masons dressed and squared the stones in their lodge, a sort of temporary wooden site hut. The Priory walls were built of carefully shaped facing blocks of sandstone. The stonemason dressed the facing blocks using a mason's chisel or axe. Drills and fine chisels were used for decorative works. Norton Priory would have been a major monastic house. Like other religious houses in the Middle Ages, it included living quarters arranged around a square cloister garden, while the church was in the shape of a cross. 
next to the church lay the community buildings, enclosing this quiet and secluded garden, surrounded on all sides by a covered passage, the cloister wall. Norton Priory was the first Augustinian priory to be established in northwest England, and only the seventh in the whole country. The undercroft at the priory is the only medieval building to have survived. This part of the 12th century storage range was used as a beer cellar. In 1536, King Henry VIII brought about an end to religious life at Norton after 400 years, as he broke away from Rome and the Pope's control over the English church. In just four years, the process known as the dissolution of monasteries closed all of England's monasteries, more than 800. Monastic estates were sold off by the king. For nine years, the priory at Norton stood empty, was robbed, desecrated, and parts of it demolished. In 1545, Sir Richard Brooke, Vice Admiral of England, bought Norton Priory from the Crown for £1,500. He converted some of the priory buildings and incorporated the undercroft, Abbot's Tower, and several outbuildings into a new Tudor house. The defensive arrangement of the buildings allowed Royalists' forces to be successfully repulsed during the Civil War of 1643. Later generations of Brooks had, by 1740, commissioned the building of a grand Georgian mansion. There were butlers and chambermaids, large ornamental gardens and extensive views over unspoiled countryside. But the peace and tranquility was soon to be shattered. The rapid development of the Industrial Revolution had begun to have an effect on sleepy Runcorn. In 1776, the Duke of Bridgewater's Canal cut through the estate. Industrial pollution from local chemical works began to increase year by year. By 1921, the once proud house had become old and inconvenient, and soon the family left for greener pastures. The house was demolished and for the first time in eight centuries, Norton Priory was deserted and forgotten. Early 19th century Runcorn was a small tourist resort. Angling and bathing in the river were popular pastimes during the summer months. Both shores of the river were visited by pleasure seekers. The ferry established since 1178 as a permanent river crossing would be busy from sunrise to sunset, conveying people across to Widnes or Runcorn Gap, as it was then known. The boathouse inn at the ferry landing in Widnes was known over a wide area as the Snig Pie House, on account of the excellent pies served by the landlord made from eels freshly caught from the river. Visitors from Manchester and Liverpool came to benefit from the pure air, which was friendly and favourable. The area was a place for convalescence from various types of fever. Runcorn was picturesque. Runcorn was joined to witness with the coming of the railway. The final girder for the rail crossing at Runcorn Gap was put in place on Valentine's Day, 1868. And on May the 21st, the locomotive Cheshire, with 20 wagons carrying 500 people, passed over the bridge. The double rail track bridge also carries a cantilevered footway, which on payment of one penny, you would have the privilege of walking across. In common with other towns, the 19th century chemical industry dealt a harsh blow to its environment. The birth of industry had begun the demise of rural beauty. By 1897, the foundations for Runcorn's industrial future were laid when the Kastner Kellner Alkali Company started production at Western Point. Taking its name from the two chemists who founded it, the company exploited a new, more economic method of producing chlorine and alkali by passing an electric current through brine, salt and water. The alkali was sold to soap, paper and textile producers. The chlorine was used to make bleaching powder for the textile industry. Men worked a 10-hour day or a 14-hour night shift. Process workers were paid from 36 and tuppence, and bleach packers were paid the higher rate of 51 and sixpence.
the Mersey estuary had always posed a formidable barrier to trade between North Cheshire and South Lancashire. For vehicles, there was a distance of 20 miles between Warrington Bridge and the Liverpool ferries. By 1898, the authorities at Runcorn and Widnes had begun to explore the possibility of bridging the river by means of a transporter bridge. A year later, under the governance of the newly formed Runcorn and Widnes Transporter Bridge Company, with Sir John Brunner MP as its chairman, work on building the crossing had begun. The steel supporting towers began to rise skyward until they reached 190 feet above high water mark. They were bolted into the solid rock, which was 35 feet down on the Runcorn side, but nearer to the surface on the Widnes shore. The transporter bridge would consist of a high-level gantry along which a wheeled trolley moved. Beneath the trolley would be a suspended cargo carrying platform. Traffic would enter the platform at one side of the bridge and the mobile trolley, which would be driven by electricity, would make the journey to the other side. The transporter design had been chosen because of the Manchester Ship Canal, which had been opened several years previous for the traffic of tall, ocean-going ships between Liverpool and Manchester. The low-level design was to keep building costs down. The work was completed in 1905 at a cost of £137,363, 6 shillings and fourpence. King Edward VII was to have performed the opening ceremony on Monday the 29th of May, but was unable to do so, and Sir John Brunner MP officiated in his place. The truly remarkable thing about the suspended platform, referred to as the car, is its capability of holding at one time four two-horse loaded wagons and 300 passengers. Special accommodation is provided for passengers for protection against the weather in the form of a glazed shelter with folding doors at the end and side. The operator's cabin is fixed on top of the car so that the operator has a full view of the course, enabling his command of the car. The time occupied by the car crossing will be about two and a half minutes, allowing time for loading and unloading, it's estimated to make nine or ten trips an hour. The bridge approaches and car are illuminated with electric light, fog signals and bell, which will be sounded when necessary. The bottom of the car is about 12 feet above high water level and clears the ship canal wall by about four foot six. It's estimated that the income from the tolls would be at least 12,000 pounds per annum. Administration and running costs would be less than £2,000. The directors were delighted that not only would the bridge serve as a great public service, but would also yield a good return as an investment. Before very long, however, the company was in financial difficulty, as the bridge began to lose money at the rate of £1,000 a year. After five years, Sir John offered to transfer the whole of his share capital, £43,000, to the local authorities, undertaking to clear up all outstanding liabilities, including a £31,000 overdraft. Runcorn rejected the offer, but Witness Corporation accepted. The assets were transferred in May 1911, and almost immediately there was an increase in the number of passengers carried. For the next two years, the bridge tolls averaged nearly £5,000 a year, and Widnes Town Council felt justified in undertaking a major overhaul, which involved a new driving system and reducing the weight of the car. By the 1920s, the Manchester Ship Canal had become a major highway for shipping. The 35 and a half mile waterway constructed in the last decade of the 19th century sliced its way through South Lancashire countryside like a huge medieval moat through the townships of Weston, Runcorn, Holton, Moor and Acton. The new canal could handle the largest vessels then afloat. Ocean going ships and their paddle tugs added unique character to Runcorn and Weston Point as the procession of big ships became commonplace. The ancient ferry taking passengers to and from Runcorn at Widnes surprisingly survived the coming of the ship canal up until the arrival of the transporter bridge, which saw the ferry's last trip. Stanley Holloway's well-known monologue, Tuppence Per Person Per Trip, whilst being amusing fiction, was indeed based on fact. On the banks of the Mersey, over on Cheshire side, lies Runcorn that's best known to fame. By transporter bridge, as takes folks over its stream, 
or else bring them back across sea. In days afore transport a bridge were put up, a ferry boat lay in the slip, and old Ted, the boatman, would row folks across at per tuppence per person per trip. Now, Runcorn lay over on one side of stream, and Whitney's on t'other side stood. And as nobody wanted to go either place, well, the trade wasn't any too good. One evening to Ted's super late... The Manchester Ship Canal, it has been said, in sheer magnitude, the greatest civil engineering project of the Victorian age. And he'd paid no but five pence for three. The uncertainty of the weather over the Whitsuntide weekend, May 1934, was reflected in the lesser number of people who risked a possible soaking and discomfort of a period from home. Throughout Saturday the 19th and Sunday the 20th of May, there was little evidence of that glorious sunshine which was the marked feature of the corresponding holiday last year. Outdoor camps which had been organised were proceeded with, though it was a risky venture. A glimpse of real summer weather favoured Runcorn's annual procession on Whit Monday, but it wasn't till about noon that rain and heavy black clouds rolled away to show the blue sky. Under the circumstances, those responsible for arranging this annual Sunday school demonstration regarded themselves as being more than fortunate. The route of the procession was similar to that of recent years, travelling along High Street, Station Road, Lowlands Road, Greenway Road and onto the War Memorial where the processionists diverged. Some along Moland Lane towards the Heath and others along Highland Road to the Plantation Pleasure Grounds where children enjoyed themselves on the swing boats. As could be expected due to the unfavourable weather, traffic on the transporter bridge showed a considerable falling away over the weekend. Although the afternoon sunshine tempted people abroad, the morning had been quiet. The full total using the aerial ferry was 21,430 passengers, 1,945 cycles, 1,708 motor cars, 328 medium vehicles and 90 heavy vehicles. Runcornians would enjoy visiting places such as Liverpool Zoo on Elmswood Road, Mossley Hill, where for one shilling or sixpence, two and a half pence for children, you could see all the latest attractions, including the famous Royal Midget Circus, and at five o'clock you could witness the feeding of the lions. You could travel further afield by train with LMS on a return ticket for a penny a mile. A journey to London for only 31 and six, or a day out to Windermere for only 13 and nine. Thinking of moving? You can buy a semi-detached house on the Norman Road estate for £365 by paying a full cash deposit of £20.12 shillings, followed by weekly payments of 15 and 9 Better hurry, by 2002 it'll cost over £75,000. The Scala Theatre in Runcorn is showing Ring Up the Curtains and Laurel and Hardy in Midnight Patrol. Irwin's Grocery Store in Church Street is the place to shop, with a loaf of bread for ten pence, baked ham one and ten per pound, and potted meats by torch fourpence halfpenny each. Best bulk margarine threepence halfpenny per pound, and Cheshire cheese sixpence halfpenny or three pence. A five-year-old 1929 Morris Minor Saloon would set you back thirty pounds. It's in excellent condition according to Basie on Greenway Road, and it's taxed. Phone Runcorn three two six. Runcorn is continuing the coronation celebrations of King George VI on Monday the 24th of May 1937. Two lime trees are being planted in the grounds of Runcorn Town Hall and should prove to be the most permanent of coronation celebrations in the town. The tree planting is the work of Councillor T. Clare, the Chairman of the Council, and Councillor P. Smith, Vice Chairman. Councillor W. Gittens presided over the pleasant ceremony. The chairman said it was a delight to take part in the ceremony because the two trees planted that afternoon would be living realities when most of the other features of the coronation celebrations would merely be memories. He continued, with a bit of luck, lime trees lived for over 300 years so that there was reason to hope that those who would be living in 2137 
would say what fine people there were living in Runcorn in 1937 to plant such lovely trees. Unfortunately, one of the trees has been cut down due to its becoming diseased, caused by the boggy ground. And, says Eric Watson, town hall gardener, the other tree appears to be suffering the same fate. The Runcorn Festival on Sunday, July the 3rd, 1938, is in full swing. This year's festival queen is Miss Nora Fish. Together with her retinue and rose throwers and Miss Doris Pilkington, the ex-queen, and her attendants, they visited St. Luke's Mission Runcorn. The Reverend H.C. Harding, who conducted the service, pointed out that although we could not all be queens, we could be kings and queens in spirit and character. The Weekly News Classified section is offering the position of office boy and messenger to 14-year-olds. The starting wage is 10 shillings a week, rising to 12 and 6 at the age of 15. The appointment terminates at age 16. I wonder who got the job? Was it you? PLP Motors and Broomside Garage Runcorn proudly announced the greatest value in the history of motoring, the new Hillman Minx. This new safety saloon with triplex safety glass throughout and armless luggage platform is a real bargain at £169. Tax is an extra £7.10. shillings. Mementos were given to the Queen and her retinues. Gifts were also given to the train bearers and rose throwers and lady-in-waiting Miss May Drinkwater. During the weeks and months of 1939, the Runcorn Weekly News and District Advertiser carried front-page information relating to the impending threat of war. Nearly 300 of Runcorn's Air Raid Precautions Wardens met in the Baths Assembly Hall on Thursday the 13th of April to hear the official reports on their exercise on the night of the blackout. At the same time, information was given as to the present state of Runcorn's preparedness for war contingencies and the progress of the shelter scheme for 10,000 people. The council had now received authority to carry out work in connection with tunnels on Runcorn Hill. It was understood that these would provide accommodation for approximately 5,000 people. One tunnel would be 200 feet long, another 850 feet, a third 700 feet and a fourth 600 feet. 
these tunnels would be adequately lighted and provided with sanitary accommodation. There's a growing concern that Runcorn could be in the danger zone. It was previously thought that Runcorn and Widnes were considered to be neutral zones, but now there's concern that the area's infrastructure, bridges and other lines of communication could be at risk. The Home Front has stepped up efforts to complete its defences. Urgent appeals for more air raid precautions wardens who are car owners make regular front page features. By August, Runcorn's ARP service is still incomplete. Blackout trials are being carried out across Britain. Runcorn's blackout operations on March the 31st were a huge success, said Wing Commander Hodsell in his letter to Runcorn Urban Council. Conscription has been in place since April, calling all men aged 20 and above to national service. From peace to war. The dreaded national emergency which has been foreshadowed for so many months, during which nerves have been tested to the utmost, has been realized and a united empire joins with France in going to the help of Poland. On Thursday the 24th of August, Prime Minister Mr Neville Chamberlain addressed a crowded House of Commons. In his historic speech he warned of the world crisis and that Britain was confronted with the imminent peril of war. By order of Herr Hitler, German forces marched on Poland, bombing the capital Warsaw. An immediate meeting of the British cabinet resulted in the King signing orders for full mobilization of Britain's sea, land and air forces. Local authorities have been instructed to put air raid warning systems into full operation. The sounding of factory hooters and sirens is prohibited except to give air raid warnings. Since 11 a.m. Sunday, September the 3rd, Great Britain has been at war with Germany. Mr. Chamberlain broadcast the fateful message to the nation that no reply had been received from Germany to a request to withdraw troops from Poland and that accordingly war had broken out. In a broadcast that Sunday evening, the King called upon his people at home and across the seas to stand calm, firm and united. Local shops and businesses reacted swiftly to the news. Runcorn Industrial Cooperative suspended all concerts and lectures. St. John's Market in Widnes will now only be open during daylight hours. More than a fifth of all the population of Merseyside are being evacuated from industrial danger spots to the Lancashire seaside resort of Blackpool. In the greatest incident the town has ever witnessed, 5,649 children and 1,751 adults sharing a dozen trains and half a dozen motor coaches are to be transported to the northern seaside town. All schools in evacuation areas will be closed until further notice. The weeks turned into months and the months into years. The biggest conflict in history continued for almost six years. On the 30th of March 1945, it was revealed that Hitler had killed himself two days after Mussolini had been captured and hanged by Italian partisans. Germany surrendered unconditionally on the 7th of May, and the following day was celebrated as VE Day. The war in Europe was over. 100 million people had been militarized, and over 44 million killed. 15 million soldiers, 20 million Russian civilians, 6 million Jews and over 4 million Poles. America sustained less than a half a million lives lost, but they bore the biggest financial loss, $341 billion. Towards the late 1940s, the rapid development of the motor car was taking its toll on the transporter bridge. The aerial ferry was no longer adequate for the volume of traffic and foot passengers. Long queues would form on both ends of the bridge, causing severe congestion. You could queue and even drive along on the wrong side of Mersey Road leading up to the transporter without being prosecuted. The Ministry of Transport agreed that a road bridge linking Cheshire with Merseyside was the solution, but not until there was sufficient revenue to fund the project. 
In the meantime, the designers of the famous Sydney Harbour Bridge in Australia, Messrs Mott, Hay and Anderson, were looking at ways of spanning the River Mersey and Ship Canal using a similar steel arch design. Runcorn, like many other towns across the country, was enjoying a time of full employment by the 1950s. The tanning industry, which had sustained the town during the earlier effects of recession between the two great wars, was enjoying great prosperity, but this was to be short-lived. Tanneries became doomed by the onset of man-made substitutes, and soon they became part of history. Highfield Tannery, Runcorn's largest, lasted until 1968, when it ceased production and eventually ceased to be. By 1956, the plans for the new road bridge were in place, and in May, work began on both sides of the river. Unfortunately, the amount of money made available was not sufficient for the four-lane carriageway which the designers were convinced was necessary. The ministry would not increase its figure, so the designers went back to their drawing boards and adapted their plans. The demolition of housing had been the first consideration, Runcorn Urban District Council agreed that 44 houses in the Hope Street area would have to be demolished to make room for the approaches to the new bridge. The effects of bridge building were devastating. At Runcorn, Abel's Boatyard was the first site to be required for bridge works. They received £3,500 compensation. Other properties soon followed. At Runcorn, the foundations for the 4,000-ton pier carrying the thrust of the arch were constructed on the bank of the Manchester Ship Canal. Things were a little trickier on the Widnes side. The pier needed to be sited on the Mersey foreshore, which meant contractors working in three feet of water, and because of the tides, only five hours a day were possible. The skewback piers were completed in 1958. The 140-foot by 70-foot piers each contained 7,500 cubic feet of concrete. Workmen started construction of the steelwork for the 250-foot side spans, and by September 1960, the arch structure had risen 280 feet into the air. The two halves have 48 steel cables to keep them from falling into the river below. When complete, the cables will be slackened to allow the two halves to join together. In the closing stages of the work, the Joint Bridge Committee announced that after all their deliberations, they decided to name the bridge the Runcorn Witness Bridge. To outsiders, it's simply known as the Runcorn Bridge. Peeling bells, cheering crowds, flags and bunting in a riot of colour provided the perfect setting for Princess Alexandra's visit on the 21st of July 1961 the occasion of the bridge opening ceremony. Many homes had needed to be demolished to make way for the bridge's approaches and massive structure, creating a huge impact on the lives of the local folk during its construction. But for the time being, at least, all that's forgotten as the car carrying the princess finally arrives at Greenway Road to be met by hysterical waves and cheering. Lord Leverhulme greeted the royal visitor as she stepped from the car at the specially erected enclosure stands. Sir Thomas Hargreaves, chairman of the bridge joint committee, told Princess Alexandra and those gathered, this bridge will be a greater tie between the twin towns of Runcorn and Widnes. It will, I suggest, attract more industry and bring greater prosperity, not only to Runcorn and Widnes, but to the surrounding districts. It's a fine bridge and reflects great credit upon the engineers. Princess Alexandra then, following tradition, handed Sir Thomas a penny before cutting a white ribbon to declare the bridge open. At the same time, Runcorn Parish Church rang out a peal of bells. During the celebrations on the opening day, it might have been easy to forget that at 6 p.m. that evening, the corporation's transporter bridge was to make its last journey for fare-paying passengers. For 56 years, it had clattered and banged to and fro across the river. Many people were saddened, and even Princess Alexandra, sensing the feelings of local people for the bridge, had commented to dignitaries on the sadness of the occasion. However, nobody would miss its tolls, long queues and delays, and nightly closure at 11.30 p.m., or tendencies to break down.
The following day, a crowd gathered at each end of the old transporter to witness the end of an era. 300 invited guests and dignitaries boarded the aerial ferry for the final sentimental journey. At seven minutes past 11, the gates clanged shut for the last time, and the car slowly rattled toward the Widner shore to the accompaniment of ship sirens. Among the passengers was 84-year-old Mr. Shaw, who'd been the first transporter car driver half a century ago. The waiting crowd, singing Now is the Hour, broke into cheers as the car slowed down, coming finally to rest at the pier. The Victorian engineered masterpiece, with its 190-foot towers and lace-like ironworks, will soon be demolished. And whatever the frustrations it may have caused for motorists towards the end of its life, to children at any rate, it was one of life's greatest treats. For a short while, the three bridges stood side by side, offering quite probably the only place in the world where three bridges crossed over a thousand feet in such close proximity. The 60s, as the previous decade and since the end of the war, was a time when communities were wholesome, neighbors cared for and knew one another, churches had huge congregations, summers were sunny and healthy, and walking days were hugely popular. The whole community joined forces and took to the streets in a show of witness and unity. But change was waiting round the corner. By 1964, the most momentous event in Runcorn's long history was beginning to occur. Under the New Towns Act, a designation order was made to create a new town which would provide housing and employment for people from North Merseyside. This would see an ultimate population of 90 to 100,000 by the end of the century. 37 farms on 7,500 acres of land will soon be swallowed up as part of the master plan for Runcorn. Developers for the new town are keen to recognize the importance of the contribution of the past, saying the town and nearby villages already have roots in history which will be valuable in bringing a sense of continuity in time and a feeling of stability. These are advantages which some other new towns do not have to the same extent. The genius of locality of many old places within the designated area is something to be cherished. By 1965, pay-per-view television had arrived. With immediate installation, Riley & Co Limited, who operate from Regent Street and Bridge Street in Runcorn, are offering slot meter TV on a no deposit basis with free valves, tubes and service. By feeding sixpences into the slot meter, you can pay and save as you view. If you prefer, you can rent this lodger in the lounge from only six and six a week. That's about 33 pence. The programs to watch this weekend include Z Cars on BBC or stay up late to watch the Eamon Andrews show over on ITV, which is followed by the epilogue. The TV networks, both of them, will shut down before midnight and won't start up again till after nine the next day. Petrol prices are down at Bush Garage of Surrey Street, Runcorn, to less than five shillings a gallon. Well, that was 1965. The swinging 60s, as the 1960s are referred to, weren't exactly swinging for the townsfolk of Runcorn. There's fear that the old town would be swallowed up with a subsequent loss of identity by the coming of the new town developments. The corporation issued a compulsory purchase order to buy up 208 acres of land, stretching from Highfield Tannery to Haddock's Wood, bordered by the Bridgewater and Manchester Ship Canal. The life of Astmore Tannery is over. An important feature of the master plan is a new town centre located south of Holton, said to be the best position to serve the whole town. Construction of Runcorn Shopping City began in 1968, and by the end of 1971, a new shopping centre, offices, car parks and bus station came into use. Over a half a million square feet of shopping space is provided, predominantly at one level. 
The totally enclosed air-conditioned building contains shops, a cinema, public houses, restaurants and includes space for a dance hall and squash courts. The four column-free multi-storey car parks adjacent to the shopping area accommodate 2,400 car parking spaces. On Friday the 5th of May, colourful flowering tubs had appeared like magic on the roundabout at the bridge as Runcornians, old and new, turned out in their thousands. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and His Royal Highness Prince Philip are coming to Runcorn to perform the ceremony of unveiling a plaque to commemorate the opening of Shopping City. The old-fashioned but gleaming royal train pulled into Runcorn Station half a minute ahead of schedule at almost 10 to 3. There was a tumultuous cheer from the huge crowd as the royal visitors emerged from the train after the playing of God Save the Queen by the band of the 1st Battalion, the King's Regiment. Her Majesty, wearing a shocking pink coat and hat with navy blue accessories, seemed to disregard the timetable as she went about chatting and meeting people in the crowd. In the station yard, the sounds of the band and the cheering crowd created a right royal welcome as the Duke, dressed in a dark grey striped suit with white handkerchief peeping from his top pocket, inspected the guard before the couple got into the see-through royal car. As the car moved off, there was a sustained burst of cheering, flag and streamer waving along the route to Shopping City. Crowds had been gathering at the new giant shopping centre since before midday. Charles Ford, member of Warrington Cine Society and a true Runcornian, had made preparations well in advance to capture the royal occasion for posterity on film by buying himself a brand new Prin Sabre Cine camera for £19.50 from the newly opened branch of Dixon's. At the plaque unveiling, a gift of flowers was presented to the Queen by Miss Karen Mayhew. And at the community centre, Miss Caroline Rose Tyrrell of the Holy Spirit School also presented Her Majesty with some flowers. The Royals departed Runcorn bound for Speak Airport almost half an hour behind schedule, a sure sign they'd enjoyed their visit to the town as much as the townsfolk had enjoyed them coming to visit. Roasting in hot summer sunshine, Runcornians turned out in their thousands to see the public event of the year, a weekend of colour, excitement and good family fun during the 1973 Runcorn Carnival. The parade on Saturday, a thread of music, spectacle and in parts downright tomfoolery, snaked its way through the streets leading up to the full afternoon's displays and entertainments at the Latham Avenue field. There was great applause for the outstanding floats and crazy dresses, mixed with screams and roars of delight from both children and adults. Displays from local bands, organizations such as Cubs and Brownies, Morris dancers and jazz bands, even a motorcycle display team. Carnival time was tops for Holton's disco dollies and their followers, while the Castellet seniors and juniors had their tambourines ready. This year's Runcorn Rose Queen is Elaine Roberts, her lady-in-waiting is Tracy Hearn, and Yolanda Wood is the retiring queen. The town's leading lady is Kathy Prothero. There's music from the strains of the pipes to the hum of the kazoo. The RNA won first prize with their flowery interpretation of the old transporter bridge in the Rose Queen tableau. Next year's carnival plans are set to herald great change as the twin towns, Runcorn and Widnes, merge into the new Cheshire County District which will be called Holton on April the 1st, 1974. The idea is to have a joint carnival with Widnes. The hosting of the event will be alternated each year. Plans to widen the congested Runcorn Bridge got underway in 1974. The 12 million pound project will include the widening of the carriageway to 40 feet and to improve the approach roads. The work is due to be completed by spring 1977. Holton once again opened its heart to royalty on Friday the 2nd of November 1979 when the Queen and Prince Philip included Runcorn and Widnes in their whistle-stop tour of Cheshire. Banners flew and flags were waved as the Royal Train, Commonwealth Spirit, pulled slowly into Runcorn Station. As the Queen stepped onto the platform, she looked up to smile and wave to the crowds who'd waited in the bitter cold to catch a glimpse of the Royals. 
The Queen, dressed in a flattering peach dress and matching hat, strolled through the station, closely followed by Prince Philip, who, despite his rather heavy blue wool overcoat, looked rather cold in the biting wind blowing across the car park. The couple are on their way to witness to unveil the plaque that will officially signal the completion of the Spike Island project, which is to be the United Kingdom's entry in the EEC's European Habitat Award for Urban Renewal. The limousine will next take the royal party on to Warrington. The age of the steam train provided railway enthusiasts with a bumper weekend on the 14th and 15th of April 1984 at Town Park. Summer sunshine smiled down on Holton Miniature Railway Society's exhibition as families galore enjoyed the weekend's fun. Enthusiasts travelled from as far afield as Birmingham and Bristol to display their prized possessions. Organiser of the event, Mr. John Goulden, said he was kept busy all weekend as local folk queued up for rides on the gleaming miniature trains. Return trips from Mousetrap Hall Station cost 10p via Anstey's Curve or 20p via Norton Loop. An added attraction is the Jumping Jack Bouncer, which is appreciated by parents and children alike. For 25 pence, the children can wear themselves out, while mums and dads have a moment to themselves. Money raised from the event, held twice yearly, will go towards the Holton Miniature Railway Society. There were plenty of cheers for the floats and bands, including the many youngsters who braved the soaring temperatures to join in. Those taking part included young ladies from the Grangeway Centre, dressed as saucy maids wielding tickling sticks, members of the Clifton Horse and Pony Club dressed as cowboys and Indians, and Morris dancers, without which no carnival would be complete. This year's carnival queen is Donna Woodward. Her lady-in-waiting is Gillian the Goff. Hard up Ronconians dug extra deep into their pockets, but instead of 10 pence pieces being popped into the street collecting tins, they could manage only tuppences and pennies, which means the collection will probably be half of last year's 400 pounds. Charlie White, carnival committee chairman, blamed high unemployment in the town for the lack of cash. The parade wound its way along the two-mile course from Pickow Farm Road to the Town Hall grounds. Runcorn is remembering its war heroes with a poignant procession marking the 40th anniversary of VE Day on Saturday the 11th of May 1985. Hidden behind the proud expressions of ex-servicemen and women as they parade through the town and the throng of people who lined the streets are countless stories of personal loss and tragedy. Memories will no doubt be switching to those who didn't return from the bloody battlefields to tell their story. And yet the day is a day of celebration of four decades of peace in Europe and one in which sons, fathers and grandfathers are able to take part. From its starting point outside the Royal Naval Association's Holton Road headquarters, the procession winds its way through the streets with All Saints Parish Church its destination. The interdenominational service of remembrance at All Saints Church was conducted by Canon Donald Thomas, who addressed a packed congregation with some controversial comments, saying, it's time to stop looking back. There's a good case for remembering this date, he explained, but I hope after this we'll confine all such things to the history books and stop looking back. 
Unaffected by the cannon's comments, these proud campaigners with medals glistening in the afternoon sun are taking the VE Day anniversary procession in their stride. The day will close with refreshments at the RNA's headquarters and a colour ceremony at sunset. It's Saturday the 17th of May 1986 and fans are gathering in readiness to board coaches that will take them to Wembley Stadium for their team's historic first appearance in the FA Trophy Final. And despite the gloomy weather, the fans are in high spirits. Runcorn AFC fans arrive at Wembley's Twin Towers in plenty of time to soak up the atmosphere. Runcorn AFC, the Linnets, were founded in 1918 when a local tannery owner and benefactor acquired the Canal Street ground and the football club became one of the many activities of the Highfield and Camden Tanneries Recreation Club. The club ran under the umbrella of the tanneries until the formation of Runcorn AFC in 1953. In its first season, 1918-1919, Runcorn became members of the auxiliary section of the Lancashire Combination and success was immediate. They won the Lancashire Junior Cup by beating Blackpool RAMC 2-0 in a replay at Anfield and were the only Cheshire club to do so. The following season, Runcorn became one of the founder members of the Cheshire County League. Success continued, with Runcorn emerging as champions in the inaugural season. They repeated this feat in 1936-37 and 1938-39, and then retained their title the following year in 1939-40 albeit the wartime West section. Runcorn's final Cheshire County League Championship came some years later in 1962-63. Runcorn's county connections were enhanced by winning the Cheshire League Cup in 1936-37. This led to them being invited to take part in the Cheshire Bowl, a competition normally only open to football league clubs resident in Cheshire. Runcorn showed their strong cup pedigree by beating Tranmere Rovers, then League Division 3 champions, 5-4 in the final at Canal Street. However, success in the Cheshire Senior Cup was a little more spasmodic. The only times that they won the competition during the pre-war years was in 1924-25 and 1935-36. They soon made up for lost time in the 1960s, winning the competition in 1961-62, 1964-65, and 1967-68. Success continued with two wins in the 1970s, these coming in 1973-74 and 1974-75. Runcorn's best spell in the competition came in the 1980s, with the Linnets capturing the trophy for five successive years between 1984-85 and 1988-89. Runcorn became founder members of the Northern Premier League in 1968-69, winning the title just seven years later in 1975-76. They also won the Northern Premier League Cup in 1974-75 and 1979-80. However, Runcorn's most successful season was 1980-81, when they did the Northern Premier League treble, winning the championship, cup and shield, along with promotion to the Alliance Premier League, the pinnacle of non-league football. Runcorn didn't let up and shocked the non-league world by taking the Alliance Premier League Championship at the first attempt by a seven-point margin, losing only five matches. Success continued apace, winning the Alliance Premier League Cup in 1982-83 with the Alliance Shield and 1984-85 before reaching today's FA Trophy Final at Wembley. Altrincham are on the attack as the ball's pass to Gary Anderson, who slips it along the goal line, passing back to Peter Farrelly, whose first time shot finds its mark, leaving Ray McBride no chance as the ball hurtles into the back of the net. Despite the determination of the fans willing their side to win, several opportunities to equalise the score were well defended. Runcorn narrowly lost to arch rivals Altrincham 1 0. Mark Carter and Graham Jones applaud the Runcorn fans who've given them their wholehearted support. They're a credit to the team, and if supporters could win matches, Runcorn would have won hands down. It's a deflating, distressing end of the Linnets' long and distinguished Wembley campaign, with every face telling the story of the most bittersweet experience in Canal Street's history.
along with many clubs in football nowadays, Runcorn have struggled against relegation and with financial difficulties in recent years, the 2000-2001 season saw the Linnets play their last ever game at their Canal Street home after 83 years as they had to raise funds to pay off spiralling debts. The Linnets now look forward to playing in the excellent facilities of the AutoQuest Stadium, arguably one of the best grounds that non-league football has to offer. Pages of adverts have crammed the weekly news for weeks leading up to the largest free show in the country, The Holton Show. The two-day spectacular is taking place on Saturday the 20th and Sunday the 21st of July 1991 with an extensive program of events. The Holton Show is held here at Spike Island each year in July. The happy sounds of family fun here today are a far cry from sounds that would have been heard in the days when it was a hive of industry. The Holton Show began on August the 12th, 1984, when visitor numbers were around 20,000. This weekend's event has been witnessed by 100,000. The main arena offers top-class show jumping with international competitors including Harvey Smith, thrilling motorcycle displays, aerobatics, a military band, dog displays and a dog and duck rodeo. Queues of visitors waiting to be airborne were not disappointed as the rain kept away and the helicopter took to the skies. Gasps of amazement came from the village green as Stromboli, sword swallower and fire eater performed his captivating stunts. In 1833, this was the world's first custom-built railway dock. The Sankeybrook Canal linked St Helens with Widnes to provide a cheap course of transport for the export of coal north of the Mersey. Later, a railway was laid to Spike Island and a dock cut to allow direct shipment of coal to river barges, giving ease of access to Cheshire and Liverpool. In 1850, William Gossage established a soap works for producing his world-famous magical soap at Tuppence a Pound. By the 1960s, all industrial activity had ceased. Christine Day, in her first year as show manager, said she was delighted with the whole two days. From a policing point of view, too, the weekend passed without any major problems. The cobblestone streets of the town are being resurrected in the form of a distinctive new public work of art, which will reflect an important part of Runcorn's heritage. Landscape design and construction worker Giles Worrell is busy building the Runcorn Loop, a monument to the town's history as a busy dock during the Canal Network's heyday. It's part of the Dukesfield regeneration. Manchester-based artists Hetty Chapman and Karen Allerton, who were commissioned by Holton Borough Council, have worked closely with Runcorn All Saints Primary School children, the Waterloo Community Centre-based Active 8 Youth Group, and elders at nearby Churchill Mansions, as well as local artist Julie Kavanagh, to bring their plans to fruition. Some finishing touches are being made in readiness for the unveiling ceremony on November the 23rd, 2001. The bronze mooring bollard is to remind us of when the area was buzzing with throngs of people from industries using the canal a hundred years ago. The outer metal ring features patterns of items such as horseshoes, lock keys, fish and mooring rings. The cobbles surrounding the bronze works show the knotted and twisted pattern of the ropes used to pull the canal boats. A low wall around the site features portholes, designed and created by Julie Kavanagh, enabling people to view the artwork from unusual angles. The dome of the bollard is etched with many reminders of how steeped in history the area is. Over the years, there have been many changes to this once rural beauty spot. The area's waterways and river crossings have each brought their own problems, as have rural planners and developers yet they've also brought wealth and prosperity. Some of the town's characterful buildings have disappeared, but much of the old town remains unchanged.
Norton Priory, derelict since the 1920s, has sprung back to life. Work, which began in 1970 with the excavation of the Priory, continues to date with the conservation of the area, which today is Norton Priory Museum and Gardens. Ron Rimmington, stonemason, has a full-time job retaining the 800-year-old sandstone foundations. The walled gardens, originally the kitchen gardens, are once again a place of beauty. The museum, which is open all year round, attracts visitors from all over, and the award-winning educational program makes Norton Priory Museum and Gardens a big hit with schools too. Plans to build a second bridge over the River Mersey have moved a step closer. Scientists have begun studying how to span more than a thousand feet across the estuary, which includes the Manchester Ship Canal. The idea isn't a new one. An article referring to an additional crossing appeared in the Weekly News more than ten years ago. The current bridge has served the area well, just as the old transporter did in those far-off days. But the landmark steel structure has become steadily choked with traffic, to the point that having only a single crossing is damaging the area's economy. The bridge is struggling to cope with nearly 80,000 vehicles a day, a figure that's set to rise by 20% in the next five years. The new bridge will be upstream from the current structure, and Holton Council is keen to future-proof it with a second tier to carry modern public transport as well as cars. It's hoped to have the bridge in place by 2007, provided the government helps with the cost, which is likely to be £150 million. The present bridge, which opened 40 years ago, cost £3 million to build. Runcorn Old Town is about to see massive change through the planned regeneration scheme. With its renaming of Runcorn on the Mersey to shake off the old image, the town is, over the next few years, likely to see a major facelift with plans to revitalize the shopping area and older houses. Runcornians can look forward to the 21st century bringing new challenge and renewed growth and prosperity. Much of the town's rich history, however, will remain just a peep in the past.